This is part three of three of chapter one, an introduction to biology. In this part, the third part of this chapter, we're going to look at what is biology. And if you remember from the first part, I answered that biology is the study of life. So this study part in the definition it actually refers to science. And if you think of science as a verb instead of a noun, we can ask, how do scientists actually do science? So think of it more as like a verb, it's an action, it's something that you're gonna participate in, especially in lab. So basic definition of science. So science is just the observation, the identification, the experimental investigation, and the theoretical explanation of natural phenomenon. And because we're looking at biology, the study of life, we're going to look at the science part in relation to how living things work, how they behave, you know, kind of looking at more of the experimental side of this. Because science, again, it is also a verb, so it's an action that you'll be doing. And to remember, the really important thing in lab is curiosity. So curiosity is the key. So just for example, we have curiosity. So millions of people saw the apple fall, but Newton asked why. Why did the apple fall? And then, you know, he came up with this idea of gravity, and they tested it, and now it's a law. So in lab, it's really good to be curious, to try to understand why you're seeing things, understand, you know, what you're doing, not just following through with the actions and trying to get through it. So ask questions and lots of them. In biology, we can actually do science or investigate life at lots of different levels. So in part one, we looked at these 10 levels of organization. So it starts off with very small atoms. These atoms come together to build molecules. Those molecules build up macromolecules that produce cells. Remember, cells are that smallest unit of life that we're going to be looking at. And then after cells, you get tissues, organs, full organisms. You get populations of organisms, communities, ecosystems, and then the whole biosphere. So all of the earth and the atmosphere and everything that lives in it. So just to show you different types of biologists that look at these different levels, and I'll go through them kind of quickly. So at the smallest level, at the atoms and molecules, you can do molecular biology. So this is a little more chemistry, but how it relates to living things. So that's the molecular biology. If we go up, there's scientists that look at cells. So we have cell biology looking at how cells grow, how they divide, how they develop. Above that you have anatomy and physiology. So looking at different tissues, bones, muscles, how they create organs, you get organ systems. How those systems all work together, so the physiology part in that one organism. And we have or we offer anatomy and physiology classes here. So it's kind of an introduction. That's what you'd be looking at in that class. So it's tissues and organs and organ systems. Above that, we have ecology. So this is looking at how organisms interact with each other and their environment. So how organisms interact with each other and their population, how they interact with other species, how they interact with the water, with the soil, with all the non-living things. And then finally we have systems biology, which includes all of these different levels of organization at the same time. So this is where we have scientists, they're looking at um, certain molecules, for example, and how those molecules interact with a whole organism. So you can kind of jump to different levels from very small level to the larger level. So systems are everything. 
these different scientists, they can approach science in two different ways. So the first way, the discovery-based science, we're not going to do a lot of that, or I'm not planning on doing it. It may just happen to you. But discovery-based science, I'll look at that one, tell you what it means. The other approach is the hypothesis testing approach. This is the approach that uses a scientific method, if you've heard of that before. That's the approach that we're really going to be focusing on in lab for this course. So first off, the discovery-based science. This is when we just collect and analyze data without the need for a preconceived hypothesis. So we don't actually, um, there may be a goal, but there's nothing that we're testing. So for example, drug discovery is a good discovery-based science. So this is where people, they sit in the lab, they run the same test over and over and over, they collect tons and tons of information, they analyze that data, and hopefully they discover a new drug that can treat a disease. So this is more just kind of you luck out, I guess, based on you collect so much data that eventually you're going to get something that has meaning. So that's the discovery-based science. The other type is the hypothesis testing science. And again, this is what we're going to be using in lab. It's using the scientific method. Um, and first, the very first lab this semester is all about the scientific method and learning about it. So in your scientific method, if you look at the diagram up on the slide, so you start off with observations up at the top. So this kind of goes back in history. So biology used to be called um, a natural science, or we had naturalists. These people, they basically go out, they just observe how organisms interact with each other, they write it down, just collect data. Then based on these observations, they come up with a hypothesis. So these hypotheses, these are educated guesses of what um, you think, why you see a certain observation. So you're trying to answer, why does this happen? Why is this animal doing this, for example? You try to answer that question with a hypothesis. This hypothesis, we then design an experiment to test our hypothesis. And we'll go into experimental design in a little bit. From your experiment, you collect data, and then you do data analysis. And then from that data, you come up with some type of conclusion at the bottom. So this conclusion can go one of two ways. Your conclusion's either going to reject, so if we go to the left from conclusion, you're going to reject your hypothesis. And so you actually have to go back and create a new hypothesis. Then you'll test it, collect data, make a conclusion. The other way is that your conclusion can support your hypothesis. So your educated guess, you actually had data support it. If a hypothesis has lots and lots of support by lots of different scientists, that hypothesis can become a theory. And you see theory down at the bottom on the right on this chart. So this scientific method, it's just a method or series of steps that scientists go through to actually do the science. First we're going to look at the hypothesis, and I kind of talked about this a little bit already, but a hypothesis is just a proposed explanation for a natural phenomenon that we observe. So you remember you start with your observation and then you form a hypothesis. So we're going to run through an example here. So a hypothesis, um, let's say for example you observe that leaves change color in the fall and they fall off the trees. So that's an observation. So a hypothesis would be to explain why we see this observation. So why the leaves are changing color, why they're falling off. And we could say that um, it's because of temperature, it's getting colder, the days are getting shorter. Um, so those are possible hypotheses. 
These hypotheses are educated guesses. You have to make the predictions from these hypotheses. They have to be testable. So we have to be able to design the experiment to actually test if we support or reject our hypothesis. The hypothesis, we also have to make it falsifiable so that we can reject it. So, and like I mentioned, it's either supported or rejected. We never prove a hypothesis true because you can't prove things in science because there's always something that could come up to reject your hypothesis. So far in our scientific method, we've looked at observations and we talked about hypotheses. The next part is the experimentation part. So, as I mentioned, we're going to go a little more into depth about experimentation. So experimental design in lab, usually when you design an experiment, you'll have an experimental group and you'll also have a control group. In a lot of our labs, we'll usually only have an experimental group, so you won't have to worry too much about the control group for right now. But some experiments, they absolutely need to have a control group. So you'll set up your two groups that you're going to test in your experiment. And to your experimental group, you're going to apply your independent or experimental variable. So this is what you as a scientist are going to change. And you can have multiple experimental groups. So your independent or experimental variable, it could be temperature, and you could do multiple groups, so anywhere from, um, could put some, or one group in zero degrees Celsius, another group at 10 degrees Celsius, another group at 40 degrees Celsius, and so on. So you can have multiple experimental groups up here. You'll apply your independent variable to your experimental group. Your control group, you'll just keep it at a flat variable, so you're not going to change that variable. You'll let the experiment run, and then the data that you collect from your experiment is called the dependent or measured variable. So your dependent variable, it's going to depend on your independent variable. So dependent variable depends, the outcome of it depends on your independent up at the top. So your dependent variable, again, is what you're going to be measuring. And this could be like a size, for example, growth rate. Um, we're going to be measuring a lot of different types of rates for your dependent variable. So try to familiarize yourself with independent versus dependent, because it's going to be really, really important in lab to know the difference between the two. And for experimentation, we'll really, really work on that in lab. So be prepared to struggle a little bit, but you'll get the hang of it very quickly. So you'll collect your dependent variable, that's your data, and you're going to analyze it and create a conclusion at the bottom. I already covered, or I already talked about the rejection of your hypothesis and the support of your hypothesis, so I won't go through that again. But the final part is this theory down at the bottom. So I'm going to quickly go over this theory part. The way we use the term theory in science may be different from how you use it in just your normal everyday life. So try to really understand what a theory is in terms of science. So up here we have a theory. It's a broad explanation of some aspect of the natural world. And besides being a broad explanation, it is supported by a very large body of evidence. So we have to have multiple experiments, multiple people, so multiple scientists working on this theory. And usually it takes many, many, many years in order for something to become a theory. Theories, they are really broad explanations, so they allow us to make predictions of what we think is going to happen in other experiments. And besides allowing us to make predictions, just like a hypothesis, we can't prove theories because there's always something that could come up that could 
reject this theory. So remember, never use the word proven. We can't prove anything in science. We can just support it. So theories, if you remember from the first part of this chapter, we already talked about one theory. And that was the cell theory. And it was actually the first characteristic of life. So remember the cell theory, it states that all living things are made up of cells. Cells are that smallest, most basic unit of life. And that cells can only come from pre-existing cells by cell division. So you already are familiar with one theory. I've also mentioned the theory of evolution. So evolution, it's also considered to be a theory. There's lots and lots of evidence to support it. And then another one that we're going to look at is called the theory of inheritance or the theory of chromosomal inheritance. And we'll look at this later in the semester, but basically it states that we have DNA, it's condensed down into chromosomes. These chromosomes are what we pass on to our offspring. So the chromosomes are what we inherit from our parents. So these are just three theories that we're going to be looking at in this course. So scientists, they really like to go through the scientific method. They like to collect data. All that is, you know, fine and dandy. But the really, really important part of science is that it's actually very, very social. So normally you think of scientists are sitting in their lab. They don't know how to interact with other people. But in reality, um, scientists, they like to go out. They like to go to the bar, they like to brag about their experiment. Um, so here is a picture of me at a conference in, um, it's either Indiana or Oklahoma somewhere, but this is my poster for my master's work, shown here and me standing by it. So they have things like poster sessions where you have hundreds of posters and people just walk around. You can talk to the person that did the research, ask them questions. Um, also at these conferences, people give talks to present their research. So very social, um, very, very interactive. Okay, so this was part three of chapter one. So we are looking at biology, remember it's a study of life, and that study part is a science. So just to remind you again, science, it's actually, you can use it as a verb, so it's something that you're going to be doing throughout the course. And scientists, you can look at life at different levels, those 10 levels of organisms that we looked at. There's two scientific approaches, that discovery-based science, which I'm not going to focus on a lot in this course, but you may um, have this in lab. You probably won't recognize it, but it may happen. You just discover something new. But we're really going to focus on that hypothesis testing, that second one, where you make observations, you create a hypothesis, do the experiment, collect data, come up with a conclusion. And then in addition, science is very social. So remember that. So it's really good to share your results with other groups, talk about what you're doing wrong. That's all part of lab. So don't just stick to your group, you know, talk to other groups, see if you can troubleshoot with each other. So this was chapter one, so thank you.